Who was Aleister Crowley to you? Robert Anton Wilson, 1932 until 2007, an author primarily of fiction, wrote Crowley as a character into his 1981 book, Masks of the Illuminati. And from this source comes the otherwise apparently apocryphal, quote, They treat me foully who call me Crowley, those who know me call me Crowley. I know Crowley as an author, primarily of nonfiction and poetry, whose style I rank on par with the utter surrealism of his later contemporary, William S. Burroughs, 1914 until 1997. I was once chastised for posting a video of Allen Ginsberg, 1926 to 1997, reading his 1956 poem, Howl, because, apparently, Ginsburg had once been a card-carrying member of NAMBLA, at least according to Wikipedia at that time. Ginsburg had been Burroughs' gay lover during the Beatnik generation prior to the free love generation of the hippies in the 1960s. Of course, if we are to believe Crowley's own words in his Magical Diaries from 1910, what he was getting up to with Victor Neuberg, 1883 until 1940, was certainly far more scandalous. Personally, I've seldom had difficulty distinguishing between the artist and their art. In other words, if I can find inspiration in their work, I tend to forgive the creator for much of the suffering that contributed to creating it. In short, if I enjoy the ends, I tend to overlook the means. This isn't necessarily a good habit, nor one I'd recommend others follow. It's just a matter of personal taste. Every independent thinker from Timothy Leary, 1920 to 1996, and Oscar Wilde, 1854 to 1900, in modernity, to Socrates, 470, until 399 BC, in the ancient past, has been accused of corrupting the young. In Plato's recounting of the trial of Socrates, the Archon of Athens accused Socrates of leading the youth of Athens astray from the, straight, from the state gods. It should be noted that, at that time, pedophilia was normal in Athenian culture, and so as it were, Socrates was charged with the same crime, but for the opposite reasons, as later on were the homosexual Wilde or the acid head Leary, both of whom were also put on trial in their days, though neither was forced to drink the fatally poisonous hemlock like Socrates of old. Again, I am not meaning to make any argument in favor of the libertine lifestyles led by any of these men. There can be zero question that they were all unrepentant sinners in the eyes of the Abrahamic faiths. These men were all, in fact, proud rebels against the tyrannies of this faith in their own ways. As Martin Luther, 1483 until 1546, once advised, sin and sin boldly, that we may make our repentance all the greater as well. In summary, the Aleister Crowley I know from reading his works and the Aleister Crowley known to his peers and contemporaries are likely very different entities, and I would wager if they were, uh, if they met, they would fight. And someday, I imagine, some ostentatious youngster in my future audience may perform the same thought experiment about me and decide that, in my opinion quite rightly, the soul or essence of the person laid out in their works outlasts and supersedes all the other deeds they may have done and crimes they may have committed during their lives. In conclusion, again, I am not saying that producing good works does nor should exonerate the guilty for their crimes or absolve the sinner of their sins. I also understand that when dying, each of us looks back on our own lifetime in judgment, 
and I, being an atheist, believe each of these people to have judged themselves the harshest of anyone. All are, in the end, condemned to die. Not all are condemned to be forgotten. A few live on in their works long after their bodies have died. Their inner self, reflected in their exteriorizing expression, is not confined by the necessities of survival the flesh is heir to. 